Hello, Dream Team, and a very warm welcome to you all once again to a new edition of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby in partnership with City Index, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD and FX trading. It's good to have you back with us. We are back in our studio once again, cosy surroundings, and the Lord is alongside. Hello, how are we? Hask is not, and that means no, we get to talk rugby. That is brilliant, isn't it? It's a big weekend of rugby, and we get to talk about it. We get to Who would have thought about it? We love these shows. Um, it is very exciting. There's a lot to discuss, of course, with the culmination of the English season upon us. We've got a mouthwatering matchup at Twickenham on Saturday. We've got a modern day rivalry, two stories of resurgence the Montagues and the Capulets of the Gallagher Premiership as Saracens take on Leicester, uh, and a number of stories to talk around the game as well on this week's show. So with that in mind, we are joined by the fourth wheel on our car, Ben Kayser, ex of the Tigers. Ça va bien? Ça va très bien, Alex and Tins. Très, très content de vous voir. Good. You look like you're in a gaming chair. <laughs> it's a, it looks a professional setup, that, to be fair. No, it's definitely not a gaming chair. It's a chair where I sit down for a long, long time and I try to think, you know, and, and write things that make just half a sense. But uh, it's it's a very comfy chair for my fat ass. It's an exec chair is what it is for an exec man. And talking of exec men, we also have a Saris great with us this week as well, Al Hargreaves, who of course packed down with Steve Borthwick, the Tigers D.O.R., for years and years and years. I will start by saying your tan is considerably better than Borthers <laughs> at this point in the calendar. Well, and, and generally his whole generally face. Demeanor. You look happy, demeanor face. You look happy, healthy, flushed well, with colour and, and smiling. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And between the pub and the golf course, you know, yeah. these things tend to help your general demeanour, I think. How life differs, doesn't it? You can take the high road or the low road and whichever one you've taken is working out pretty well for thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take that. Good on See, you. If you. If we print that um, T-shirt that we said to about Al, live life like Al, we we can do it on it exactly. works for both it works for both Al Sanderson and Al Hargreaves. It does. How are you? Very well, thank you. Nice nice to get up the road from uh, from from Fulham. So a uh, little chip and a pat and good to be with you. We've had uh, a number of conversations, a number of meetings over the last few years or so, but I'd love to know just start by by sort of where are you at in life at the moment? You've got a lot going on. And one of the things and the reason for asking you that is you are very symptomatic, I think, of the incredible work that Saris as a club does with the players not only in their ranks, but also the ones that they look after, uh, you know, once the playing time has has come to an end. And I'd you know, just love to get a check-in, really, with what, what's going on in your world. Yeah, with pleasure. That's good of you to say. I think uh, we obviously know all the bad things about Saris over the last few seasons, and no one speaks enough about the good stuff. But yeah. I'm certainly one of the one of the beneficiaries of, of a really good culture at the club where they encourage players to get into business early on. Started a business called Wolfpack, and we now run uh, three, three of our own Wolfpack pubs in London. Yeah. serve about 400 bars and pubs around the country with our beer. So having a, a lot of fun, you know. It's it's a very you know narrow gap between selling beer and playing rugby for a living. So it's got to stick to what you're good at, really, and that's what I've Symbiotic done. Symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Sounds like brilliant. Yeah. A good way of dropping quite a lot of my household expenses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Run it through the biz. And you're not, it's not just you doing it, because you are doing it with... Yeah, I'm doing it with my business, well, business partner. There goes the voice. Yeah, getting getting emotional already. Yeah, they're excited about <laughs> it. I'm really, really oh, emotional. Oh, there comes yeah. out the beer and the golf. That's it's it. been a bit too much. Uh, Tight pants. Chris Wiles, Saracen's legend. I mean, he's a true legend. I think he played over 260 games for the club. Yeah. Um, American legend is probably tenuous. You know? uh, <laughs> three World Cups, one victory. Uh, <laughs> but he's my business partner in Wolfpack. And uh, unfortunately, you still spend a lot of time with, with him. Not that you like to remind him of his one victory at Rugby World Cup. Uh, every now and again. Um, tell us a little bit about where Sarri sits I suppose in your heart now, or, or, or for you. I mean, you do you serve your beer at the ground, obviously, but but where, where what does Saracens mean to you in this day and age? No, it's massive. I mean, you know, not not, not to ham it up too much, but I came over from South Africa w- without a huge amount of expectation. Really, I had quite a few mates playing at the club at the time. Obviously, there was the the Safa contingent, and um, got convinced to come over and, and and check out sunny North London. And <laughs> and I've got to say, I, I was I was I was just blown away by the by the way that they ran the club. You know, this was a people-first business. We had a lot of fun, worked really hard, but I just was surrounded by good, really good people. And we had a really nice balance of working hard on the field, but we had a great time as well off the field. And for me, that was always pretty important. And I actually enjoyed my rugby much more at Saracens than I did when I was down in South Africa. Good. That's yeah, good so, so, so still a still a very special place. And through the, the ups and downs, still a very passionate supporter of the club. That's good to hear. Ben, I've never actually asked this to you but what does what does the Tigers mean to you given where you played your rugby and all that you've achieved Leicester means what uh, Leicester means me being a teenager and becoming a man pretty much I was um, I was 21 year old Frenchman 
I was good at rugby, but I wasn't very good at being a tough hooker, right? I was good ball in hand. I was decent thrower, but I didn't, my scrummaging wasn't my ideal moment. And the fight side of, of Leicester, of, of playing rugby, sorry, it wasn't really for me. And so Leicester Tigers was the pinnacle of that. It was, how can I challenge myself to the absolute top at, you know, being one of a sort of a warrior side, tough hooker. And so when the opportunity rocked up, I told you that story already. I was sitting next to Gus Pichot and, you know, he's like, what are you doing next year? I don't know. I'm probably going to sign. Do you fancy Leicester Tigers? She takes his phone out, you know, texts Simon Cohen and it's like, very interesting. And it happened in two weeks. And so I, I went there a bit, you know, uh, expecting also some gray, Leicester, dark, ugly um, uh, looking city. And in the end, I found a f wonderful club of rugby. Absolutely sensational club of rugby. Wasn't blown away by the city itself, but but the club but the club is extraordinary. And I, was I felt that like I was I was drafted pretty, in the NBA. It's still pretty dark, ugly, and that was just the players I before you get to the players, city. Before you got to the spires around the city. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you two very very contrasting questions about Leicester Tigers hookers. Richard Cockrell, who's obviously now the England's forwards coach, and it's not just the Premiership final this weekend because it's also England Barbers at Twickenham. Tins has had a catch up with him, and we're going to float that interview in a little bit later on. But if you saw Kip Cockers now, would it be a little cursory nod? Would it be a hello, mon ami? Would it be a bear hug? What's what sort of relationship would you have with him in this day and age? Uh, it would totally be a bear hug. So that yeah. story of Augustine Pichot putting me in contact. Um, then Simon Cohen obviously was director of rugby. And on Monday, I get a text, Richard Cockrell, hi Ben, would like to speak. I didn't have time to answer the text. He just called me straight away and he knew everything about me. He knew, uh, you know, my ups, my downs, my, my strengths, my weaknesses as a hooker. And he really took the time to look into me properly, even as a person. I learned then later that he fell in love with, with France by playing in Clermont. I think his children were born there. He, he's, he's got a sweet spot for France. And being a mad bunkers hooker like he was as a player, you know, France was very fitting to his mindset. Um, he probably thought Leicester was a bit too soft and a bit, a bit you know, not, not, not crazy enough. Um, and so with me, we had a really tough, tough but straight, um, how do you say that? He's a straight shooter. And so when a guy like him rocks up to me, he's like, listen, I love everything about you as a player but you absolutely need to be world-class standards at the basics. And he pushed me only on the basics. And the rest, he didn't know <laughs> what I could do, right? And he, he didn't have a clue how to do it. So he wouldn't teach me that. He would just, but he was super hard and straightforward and demanding on the basics. That's precisely what I needed. So basically, if I give him a bear hug, it's because I sort of owe him one because he looked up, uh, or he, he did his research on me I, me going to Leicester, look, I, I don't know if you can see, it. I still have the jersey behind me because yeah. it really was a really important moment for me. I met my wife there. Obviously, it's the, the, the best thing that could happen. And so every time we, we bumped into each other, him coaching Toulon, me being in Clermont or all, all over the years, it was always a very respectful, kind and quite uh, genuine bear hug because I, I, I owe him one. That is very nice to hear. And I'm very much looking forward to your interview you had a good time Your yeah it was, it was good he'd have been old school when you were just coming through well he he retired from england in 99 so that world that sort of world cup that i sort of i did the world cup pre-camp pre yeah. um and then got called up during when jerry retired so um messed around with him a little bit in the in that sort of start and then just played against him for less than numerous times so yeah. um always commanded respect he was one of those Definitely didn't know what reverse was or, or backward stepping was. So, um, and told you what told you what you thought and uh, told you what he thought. So, no, he he was good fun, but always had a fun side to him, which is very rare for a Leicester player. But he did yeah. always have that side to him. Sorry, all Leicester players, I do actually like you. Good on you. We'll bring you that a little bit later on. Um, and there is no really easy way to do this, but to segue from from one former Leicester hooker to another and the uh, just unspeakably desperate news this week surrounding Tom Youngs who has lost his wife Tiffany after an extraordinarily brave battle um, with illness and there are no real words actually to kind of put out at this point but I'm sure most of you have read it in, in the papers all we can do is just send our very very best to the Youngs family um, to Ben in particular as well who I know has been incredibly supportive um, and I presume knowing him as you do Ben I mean it's very hard to find anything to say at this point but He's a tough old ox, Tom Youngs, and you know all we can do is just just hope that there is a way through, uh, and it's not just agony from here on in, really. I mean, your memories of Tom and, and Tiff, etc. I think you 
well, listen, you, you said everything there is to say. No, no words could possibly pay tribute um, or, or, you know, live up to to the crucialating pain that this this is for the whole club, especially for for Tom and his family. Um, I think Ellis said a couple of weeks ago when when Tom was announcing his official retirement that he represents absolutely everything there is about being a tough, uh, committed, soul-giving uh, Leicester Tigers captain that he will try to live up to. And, and that's that's the what Tom Young's leaves, you know, as an impression. And to, for a strong man to be able to carry himself as a leader and as a family man and as a father for all those years, that means he was he was helped incredibly. Uh, by by a strong and loving and caring woman, and so so this this pain is just uh, almost in, in, impossible to to explain. All we can do is is be there, show our love and our support, and and pay tribute to um, to a family that thoroughly deserves it. The one thing I would say at this point is that I think Ben and Tom are having a testimonial this year, and actually, if you go onto your Instagram. Young's brother's testimonial is where you can find out further information. There are an extraordinary number of events, hopefully a number of ways that people can give money. And if you've got auction prizes, if you've got ways that you think you can help, please, please, please get involved. Um, and I think we'll just say that the very best to all the family. And if there's anything we can do to help, we'd love to hear from them. Um, but I think at this point, we'll, we'll give them a bit of space, which is what they all need. Um, yeah, not really a lot to add to that but hopefully there is a, a way through this incredible pain for them let's move on because I know obviously you know Ben will hopefully be involved in the Premiership final um, an extraordinarily emotional semi-final for him last weekend um, did you watch the, the the Tigers game yeah did you find yourself thinking that this is how it, how it was meant to pan out did you think Tigers went above themselves what was your overall impression no I, I thought if things I don't. It, the first half was definitely not planned. I think if if the Northampton Saints winger, I can't remember whose name is Scosson, I think yes. Scosson. Yes. Scosson. Uh, I mean, he's he's got two incredibly uh, open opportunities to score, and the third one is a bit more complicated, and he misses all three, and and that's the only reason why Leicester was still in the fight. Now, when George Ford at the 72nd minute or something has got one opportunity to seize, just dummies and goes and scores a wonderful try. And so they were resilient. They were tough. They stick together. Uh, I didn't think they played particularly well. I think actually Saints, especially in the first half, played particularly well and really put them under the under the hammer. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a performance that they can be proud of because you just got to win those games. And you just have to win by one point, by, you know, nothing, by do you deserve it or not? Completely irrelevant. Two years ago, they were going to get relegated. Now they're going to Twickers for, what, a 10th or 11th final? Yeah. And the main difference, it's a bit like my old mates, the Saris boys, they know those moments. They cherish those moments. However, whatever the, the trip to get there, you just need to get there. And then you forget about the rest of the season and it's just about 80 minutes to actually go into history. I don't think Genji will be thinking about next year. I don't think he'll be thinking about the semi-final. He'll be thinking about 80 minutes of putting our hearts out for this team. And actually, it's probably when, when, when the, the history of Leicester will, actually, will be the most useful. It's, it's who they are. It's yeah. Twickenham. It's playing premiership finals. It's going out there. So I was very impressed by how tough they looked, how um, how they took the bullets and still got back up. I was definitely not impressed with the rugby and they're going to need to play a ton better to beat Saris. Okay. I mean, I wonder if that, that <coughs> you know, coming from that, it is that pressure of suddenly, actually where they, so far from where they've been in the last two years that, and leading, the only team to ever lead from game one to game whatever we have now, 24 of, you know, I would have been gutted if they had lost. I know that uh, what Saints have done in the last uh, 11, ga 11 games, no, seven games, taking 32 points out of a possible 35 yeah. uh, is incredible to get them there at the, unfortunately for Gloucester. But, um, you know, I, they w did ride the luck, obviously, uh, you know, to create those opportunities and not take any of them for the Saints in that first half would have, would have been such a painful pill. Um, it's such an easy, a far easier team talk at half time for Leicester than it is for for the Saints. You, even though you're going, just keep doing what you're doing. They'll come off, and in the back of your mind, you've gone, well, we've we've blown three absolute sitters. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think what Ben said there in terms of the resilience, uh, I think that's it's really good for them. I thought the crowd were absolutely immense. I know there was an occasion behind it as well, but that is what 
Leicester can bring yeah. when it's big final days and it's loud and it's hostile up there. Anyone who's played there knows that that the old stand is always hostile. You're gonna get you're gonna get a bit of verbals as you go on. But I mean, I love both games were feisty from the start, weren't they? I think it was what two minutes in the Saris game before he had to warn the players anymore. <laughs> it was a yellow. It wasn't much longer in the in the Leicester game, and you expect that local derby. Um, yeah, they'll be happy to come through that. I'm happy they did because to have played the rugby they played and be the team that they, I think they deserve to be in that final. Um, and yeah, we'll see how they go. I just feel Saris are made for finals, aren't they? But we'll, we'll see. And they're doing at the moment. Do you keep in touch with Borthers? Do you send him a Christmas card or a, the odd text or time passes? And I, I can't say that I ways. do. I mean, Borthers He's a hermit is, though, isn't he? He is a hermit. He's always been a very private person. Even when I played with him in the second row alongside him every yeah. single day, I don't think we said more than two words to each other. Is that right? <laughs> so so he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's obviously, and that's pretty much you know common knowledge, but yeah. very serious guy, very hard worker, very disciplined. Um, and he was, a, he was a wonderful leader, you know, and you can see what he's brought to that Leicester team is some of that structure and some of that that rigour. And I'm, I'm sure if you ask the players and probably the coaching staff, they probably never worked harder, right? It's no no coincidence that they've suddenly lifted their game dramatically with Steve at the yeah. at the helm. And, and I certainly learned a lot from playing with him, just technically. Was he a coach as a player? Absolutely. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, even when he was, eight, I've said this before, even when he was 18 and he came into that, that bath pack, which at that point still had a lot of internationals where you go Ollie Redmond, Steve Ajomo, Eric Peters, Ben Clark, uh, Victor, John Mallet, Herman, uh, Freddie Mendes. Yeah. I mean, and he was bossing them around then. And if they missed lineouts, he was bollocking them as an 18 year old. Right. Um, and it sort of set his stall out of where he was. He, he, he was a perfectionist. I think, you know, he wasn't the biggest of guys. So I think people had put, you know, he might be, you know, he's a very, Obviously, he's from the north as well. I think he's got, you know, he's there to prove people wrong, um, as most northerners are. And so he he demanded excellence, and he never he he trained so hard and so diligently that if you didn't do the same, he let you know about it. And, and I think that's a great characteristic. How he got named Super Nors a lot of time because of it, and and he was sometimes he stepped over the verbal lines on pit on on the pitch, but. You know, he always backed it up. He, you know, he never, he never didn't turn up for a game. So, was he obviously as a coach, as a player? But was he somebody? I, I remember, I can't remember who it was. It said there was a lot, lot of verbals that came a from both of us. Was, was that a hallmark of his game? As a, it's interesting. I, I mean, I can't say that. I, I, I wouldn't have characterised him as somebody who spoke at the opposition a lot. Interestingly, okay. unless I was just uh, the scrum cap was a bit too yes, tight. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, I think, I think he was, he was obviously tough Actually, and his competitive. Okay, wait, wait. Maybe directly, but but on the marrow sort of side, over celebrating, in your face, that kind, that kind of just in it, just north, in the moment. Yeah, in the moment. Do you see in Leicester the hallmarks of him as a player? And and the, the, I mean, I'd love to know what you've made of the job that he's done there. Well, it's, it speaks for itself, really. I'm not sure what what he had to go through from Japan. I mean, when we played against. Um, we lost two finals with, with Steve at the helm. His last two games for Saracens, the European Cup final, Johnny's last game, uh, Saracens versus Toulon at, uh, where was it? Uh, Millennium. Leon, yeah, Millennium Saturday, exactly. Now, yeah. Came back and said, okay, don't worry about that. Saints in the final next weekend and lost in the 120th minute. And both has <laughs> got straight on the plane from the stadium, went to Japan and started his coaching career. Wow. Went from there, obviously went to England and now it's taken all that, you know, that experience and, and obviously pulled it together into something that's really impressive. For him, I guess the challenge is, well, is this a sustainable, you know, kind of way that he's... Co I've got no idea. But, you know, it's probably sometimes easier to do it in the short term than the long term. What what you don't get, what a lot of people won't see from Borthers, is there is an immensely kind heart within that. Yeah. And there is like a childlike humour. His, his humour is very sort of lowbrow, but, <laughs> and there's a little giggle in there around it. And he doesn't like to show it that often. But I think he's a massive family-driven family person. And I think that's... That's why it works, is he drives standards, but he also cares and he also thinks about people a lot and what's right for people. And I think that is what Leicester needed at the time. They need that, right, this is what you have to do. This is how you work hard. But then off the pitch, you need that that personal touch. Why Sarri's, you know, with the, with the wolf pack that they, they built and that mentality and then the trips that they did and, every, and the bonding that they did as, as individuals set them on a different level uh, a long time ago and I think that's what Borthas has also fed off and, and what he has made a big big part of his coaching career 
Ben, the question, Ben, I want to ask you is, has Steve got more out of his Leicester squad relative to their talent against Saracens? Have Saracens got a better man-for-man squad than Leicester? And therefore, has Steve done more with his players? Well, well it's a good question. I think if, if you asked that question two years ago, uh, Freddie Stewart would have not been considered as international fullback. Well, now he's definitely, you know, all the way to Alex Good's type of level. Different type of player, okay, but still he is, you know, the current fullback. So I think... Player for player, it's it's um, it's a, it's a still a tough question. But anyway, I think he's he's got the best out of those players. How they compare in yeah. form at the time, you know, you can't come forward hundred caps, but so we used to peak form uh, three years ago with a guy who's got ten caps, who he's in a physique of his career. Well, all I know is that he's transformed a team that two years ago were going to get relegated. So imagine the emotional damage there is when the team, when you ask them every week, you know, you got to give more, you got to push more, you got to get back up from the humiliation for a club like that. To uh, I'm not saying it's easy to be in the relegation spot. I think it's, I'm saying it's even harder to be a Leicester Tiger as you're about to get relegated. Um, so all I know is that he's he's pushed so hard on those guys on the core basic things, and we've spoken about this quite a lot of times with, with Ellis, on who they are as people, who they want to be yeah. as a team, who they want to be as a club. And so they've, he absolutely got the best out of those, those players and, and got them to mature and to perform a lot quicker and a lot better than anybody would think. And you were asking, you know, where do we see Steve Borkwing into, into, the, into the way that they play at the moment? The lineup quality definitely has to be up there. They've been relentless, they've been super efficient. Which anything actually it might be one of the reasons why it's not so much a lineup, but the scrum. The reason why the Saints game was so complicated for them, because for once, a little bit out of nowhere, they had huge trouble, and they they were really getting pumped by by Northampton. So it's going to be one of those games where ball possession is going to be key, sticking to who you are as a as a team as a club is going to be key, and and we will have all those answers after the game. But before, you know, he, he's done a great job. He's got them there. I was going to say on, on Steve, the one thing we all know is his detail when it comes to things like the line outs and obviously the, the, the technical aspects of the game. But although he might not have necessarily been the biggest personality in the team, I think he was a, a student of leadership in the way that his one-to-one relationships were different with every single person. Yeah. So if I go back and ask my mate Brad Barrett what his relationship was like with Steve, very, very different from mine, very different to Owen Farrell, to Jamie George. So I think he took a lot of time and energy away from the field to understand how to get the most out of each player. Yeah. And that could certainly be something, Ben, that that comes through in what you're saying in that Leicester squad. Like, same players, but he's managed to, to, to squeeze, the, squeeze the lemon a little bit harder, and it's, it's been fantastic to see. Because I was looking at this, just scooting yeah. through the squad list. Yeah, I was back. Ashton, <laughs> Probably, who's yeah. come back from the dead and is playing some brilliant rugby. Freddie Burns, rejuvenated. Ollie Chesham, now in, in with England. Dan Cole, rejuvenated as a veteran. You've got people like Nick Dolly, who've sort of come right through the ranks there. Ellis Genge playing the best rugby of his career. I mean, you go on and on and on. Joe Hayes now on, on the verge of international recognition. People like George Martin, who've had a little nibble with England. It feels like there has been a real uplift in some players who, who potentially wouldn't have reached those levels. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, over the past two years, we've been going, you know, normally you go to Welford Road and you know every member of that pack. Yeah. That is what you knew, is what you were scared of in, 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 a, in a rugby way, which means you weren't scared of them, but you knew you were in for a kicking. Um, <laughs> you, you knew it was coming. It was the inevitable was coming. Whereas over those two years when they weren't, when they weren't performing, you're like, well, I don't know, I don't know anyone in that pack. Yeah. What, so people, I think, were going up there not, not scared, and then in the same in the same breath, they were losing their identity of what it was to be a Leicester Tiger, and what are you? What is that club built on? And I, I think you add all that together, and what Borthers has done, I think he's gone back to what he knew, what he remembered about Leicester. You've got to be you're a set piece first team that's got to have that on point, and then you've got to be tough, and you've got to stand up to challenges. And I think they've done that all season. He's just managed what Al said, through personal relationships to be able to get 10, 15% out of, of, of another player and, and, and the players have rewarded him with how they've played this year. He's obviously, he obviously left a few years ago now, Steve, from Saracens, but will there have been a little message this week between him and Mark McCall are those days on? Because the reason I asked that is I think Al Sanderson said that obviously having taken over at Sale, he's still chatting to them or certainly was at the beginning of the season. There was a sort of still a rapport and a bit of bouncing ideas, etc., is that Sari's brethren still 
you know, when you see old friends on the dance floor, whatever yeah, it is. I, I don't know. It's, do a, it's a good question because, because Steve, like you say, as a, as a player, he had his own kind of space that he that he you know, he worked in, and it was often separate from the group. You know, very yeah. much linked in when he needed to be. With the coaches, I assume that it was something similar. Yeah. So I mean, like Alex Sanderson was one of my closest mates at Saracens as the coach. Or, you know, as a coach, arrive there and go for a, for a, for a beer with the forwards coach on a Tuesday. You know, Borth certainly wasn't doing that. I don't think he was doing that with the coaching <laughs> staff either. So I'd actually be I'd be interested to know, but I'd be surprised. And if anything, it'd probably be a cursory good see, luck. See you there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. See you there. Fun and that. It's funny the way these things. It, it did. That factory though has produced some extraordinary coaches, isn't it? There was the photograph yeah. the other day. Yeah. Farrell, Peel, all that lot. It's not. It's not too bad, is it? No, it's I still job. believe that both is just a closet alcoholic. He goes home and gets smashed. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hearsay. TBC. Don't, don't quote me on it. The rumor starts here. Yeah. Um, Saris, did you watch the game? Oh, you were there. I was there. You? I was there. Were you pouring yeah. pints on the yeah, day. Yeah, always pouring a few pints. No, I do a bit of work at the game there's still. A, there's a strong alcohol theme coming through here, Al. Which <laughs> yeah, is, so. yeah. I don't so get into that right do, now. Do, we'll do, talk about that later. Have we got to do an intervention right Make now? Make it too obvious. I don't to think. Is that a gin brand behind <laughs> the <you> guys? <laughs> <laughs> that you guys own? It is. Actually. Okay, there we go. Um, atmosphere. It looked cracking actually, and that's sort of you know obviously the team on the field has been doing the business for a number of years, but it's worth mentioning that Stonex now is becoming. It's becoming the stadium that Saracens have wanted for a number of years. Starting to look good. The, the, the fan base is more consistent. I think we can we can do more. We can probably you know we tr we're trying to find our place in the world. The North London is now flagging the ground. This is where we are. So yeah. I think that support base has started to grow locally as well. I mean, this Quinn Sarries relationship is and and um, you know it's 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 quite tense. It's got, it's got quite weird, hasn't it? Like yeah. I always say, you know, a little little gag to start the things off. Oh, any, any Quinns fans in the house? And yeah, well, you see, you know, hear you before you see you kind of thing. <laughs> but there's always so much noise that comes out of them before a Saris game. And I think Saracens, through all the turmoil, have been quite good at going, we're not, not going to communicate outwardly. We're just going to focus on what we do and let people do all the talking in the media. But there was certainly this really aggressive build-up to it all. Yeah. And that came through in the first few minutes. Yeah. So it was a... It was a great game as a spectator, I think. Uh, but like Ben says, I don't think particularly great rugby. You wouldn't have thought that Quinn would start out with a great couple of rolling malls and a try. You know, th that way around, Saracen's poor of kick, a, a dodgy first half. But in the last 20 minutes of that game, three yellow cards, you know, Quinn's pushing hard. Anything could have happened. And I think it was a real... Like Nick is equally hold up. It was brilliant. Like, yeah, exactly. For that. Just, you know, when you need a, a momentum shift, it's going against you. I think there were two in the bin at that point. And then, then them not getting over that. It's, it's almost like a, tr a reverse try, isn't it? The, the goal line stand. Yeah, and, so it's when you've got, get out. you've got two scores, right? You know, if you score in the next, you know, it's 10 minutes to go. If you score now, it's anything can happen. But if you manage to steal another line out, bog them down in front of the five, the yeah. clock just starts ticking and the pressure just becomes insurmountable. And that's kind of what happened. What is it about Saracens that means that they peak at this right, right moment? Having been in that environment... And sort of, you know, been instrumental in, in, I think, the early years of the success. You mentioned the number of the finals and, and the pain that you had to go through. But now it is, it's a much more confident Saracens outfit when it gets to final time than it was 10 years ago. What is it about that squad, the setup, the coaches, that means come Saturday, they're back in it again, having obviously just come up again? Yeah, well, I think you said it there. I think, quite frankly, we lost a lot. You know, I think back to 2011, lost to Leicester. 2012, we won. 13, 14, we lost. You know, so, yeah, I mentioned the European Cup final, the Premiership final. You know, we lost the semi-final at home where I think we had won the league by the highest ever points tally. So we went through a lot of pain to get to the position where you get to these big games and you've got that inner confidence that you can pull it off. And, you know, matter, no matter how far you are under the gun, you, you know, if you stick to your principles and processes, you can do it. And, and, and Saracens have done a brilliant job by making sure that the number of caps on the field at any seven, at every, any given point in time is greater than the opponents, right? So those combinations, I think, are just that makes such a difference. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say you know, that you know it, those stinging losses. I remember having a couple for Gloucester, and then you can never shake that. Every year it comes around, press puts pressure on you. Oh, you've lost all these finals. That eats at you until you get to put it to bed, and then once you put it to bed, though. You just grow massively off the back of it. You're then going into those situations, going, we've been here so many times, we're now winning them, and you feed off that, and you enjoy those com those those big moments more and more and more because that's what you that's what you that's what you've been trained. Well, one of the best days I ever had off the pitch was the day after we lost that second final against Northampton. We all went out together, and and the spirits in the camp from the coaches right down to the youngsters was what a fantastic season. There was never that moment where we'd lost a final and. We sat in the change room, heads down, and the coach walked in and said, you remember what this feeling, you know, what this feels yeah. like? 
Yeah. Make sure you never hear again. Everyone went, oh, well, it is what it is. Let's crack on. And he rocked up the next season. And there was no like huge song and dance about how sad we were and how depressed we were. We said, great season. Let's get back to another final and let's do it again. And over time, people are just comfortable in those environments yeah. now. What were you dressed as for that meeting? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that was very, very normal. You know? That was it. Yeah, no, no, that was a rarity. Yeah, that was a loss, though. You know, right? <laughs> yeah. After, what was your best fancy dress off a of victory? Oh, I think, I think the best one was probably we had to come as a, as a, as a couple. Okay. So I came to uh, Baywatch, me and Jamie George, which is an unlikely odd couple <laughs> you can imagine. Please tell uh, Jamie it was uh, Pamela Anderson. It was something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Sports bra. <laughs> with no, with no, with no prosthetics involved at all. You know? <laughs> Woo. Um, do you look, Ben, at this Sari's outfit and think, Phew, this is this is an uphill task? Do you, th- do you look at them and think, Leicester will test them in ways they haven't been? What, what is your sort of head-to-head? I'm, I'm... It reminds me of a lot of memories, basically, Saracens. I, I would love to hate them, but I can't really do so uh, because, because they've built something that... As a rugby player, of course, they got caught hand in the cookie jar. Not everything's to keep, I understand. But in terms of team culture, in terms of uh, how much can I give for my teammate, I think they, they set the standards of what, what maybe most of us had when we were 18, play with your mates, you know, sticking your ass on the back of the bus uh, and, and flashing people, all that type of spirit that we all were so jealous of. And everybody was like, listen, what kind, what kind of club, you know, would go out to Barcelona to the uh, beer fest in, in, in Germany and stuff and still kill you on the Saturday? It just, just doesn't happen in this modern rugby and this and that. And, and they were doing it. And I remember distinctly the 2017 Champions Cup final that we lost in Edinburgh. And, everybody, and it, I mean, look, we were, should have lost by 35 points with Clermont, but we hung in there. And so we were actually a, a good side and we only lost by a little. And everybody's like, oh, it's because they have so much money and so much power. We were looking player by player. Yes, of course, we would have taken a few of their players. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. The, the Vunipola brothers and Owen were probably being in the bus with us. But the rest, I mean, look, I, we, we had nothing to envy them, but they had that extra spirit. They had something about them that I hated that I was so jealous of at the time, but I really, really envied. I didn't. I didn't want their stadium. Definitely not. I was to keep the Clermont one. I didn't. I didn't even want their kit. You know, I just wanted my mates, my fellas. But I wanted that spirit. And so I'm really always super, super cautious of. Mako is not the old Mako. Owen is just coming back. Mario Itoji plays a lot of rugby. X, Y, and Z, whatever. They will rock up and I reckon they will push Leicester to the absolute limit. Uh, and if there's one, if you want to call it underdog, I can't even believe you would call them underdog. But, you know, if they're so, sort of underdogs, if there's one that I wouldn't bet against, it's, it's them. Um, I, you know, so, so much respect for what they've built as, as players. I still don't think they're not as good as the level that you displayed, especially in that 2017, 18, 19, all those seasons where they really, they were unkillable. Um, but, um, I mean, look, you mentioned Jamie George. I think he had a monster of a game against Quinns and he played a full 80. And you know, when you talk about the resilience of always being there, well, you need your hooker to hit every dart, to be good on his line outs, to lead that scrum. And that's what he did consecutively. So never, ever, ever consider that they're beaten. Otherwise it will be to, to your detriment. And you know, those off field things, the headlines are, are kind of punctuated with pictures of people in fancy dress, like we spoke about. But there's a lot of wisdom in the fact that if you take people away from their day-to-day working environment, whether it be sports or something else, the, the kind of conversations you have amongst the group becomes significantly different and you do become closer to people. You know a bit more about them and that was the reason why we did the trips. That's not what gets the headline. Yeah. It sounds a little bit soft and a little bit, you know. But the irony is that every other player was envious of those because they knew what, they, what that led to. Yeah. Uh, anyone who's been in an environment like that, you know, being around, doing different things create greater friendships and make you care more about the guy to your left and, to your and we right. never lost when he came back from a trip because we know we knew if we lost it'd be a really good excuse to say oh, i can't go to beer fest again so guy that was the most important game of every season was the weekend you got after you know got back after a trip which was the best because there was skiing there was bo- <laughs> boxing. Was the boxing? boxing in germany in oh, germany it depends who you ask right there's yeah, a lot of good you. things new uh, miami Miami. I, I love going to. We went to I New York. I love the story about the the Miami the Miami tight end that you all met, and he was like, and, you, and someone said to him, "Oh yeah, 
he says, how much do you guys get paid? I said, well, we, we have a salary cap yeah. of 7.5 million. He goes, damn, I get paid more than your whole team. Yeah, so what, what do you do for a living? <laughs> well, no, that's, this is a job for us. Um, but no, they're wow. all great. Yeah, New York was great. We went to watch Blackhawks game. We went to um, one of the big music festivals, Lollapalooza. Fantastic. And came back and you know put a shift in because we wanted to do it again. Well, Ben's just punching his screen. <laughs> <laughs> do you get any of this joy, Lester? <laughs> no, but listen, we tried at Clermont. With with a tiny bit of of uh, of luck and a tiny bit of success, but yeah, we had a few Barcelona trips and all that. That's the main input of Stretz coming for Clermont for four or five years, and he brought this. He's like, "Trust me, it works. Trust me, it works." <laughs> and we and I, I was seriously doubting it, but look, like exactly like you said, we just delivered. And there's nothing better than beating a tough opponent on a Saturday and be like, "By the way, you know, we were out for the last five days." That's the sort of the, the killer punch you can give them at the end. <laughs> Secret trainers. Should we go through a few of the head-to-heads? Because, I mean, it is a mouth-watering game between these two. Just before we do that, it is worth actually just mentioning at this point because there are only two left standing. Leicester Tigers and Saracens, as we've said. Two of the biggest names in rugby. They are meeting at HQ for the big finale on Saturday, the 18th of June. If you're wanting to see some world-class action and unmissable entertainment, it's set to be hot and sunny. So we really could have an absolute points fest again. Twickenham will be the place to be this weekend. Let's hope it's a fraction of the final we had 12 months ago. And if we do uh, get that, we are in for a real treat. Uh, We are going to be there as GBNR at the home of England Rugby on Saturday for some pre-match analysis. We're going to be joined by England's most capped player of all time, Rocky Clark, and the former England rugby captain Dylan Hartley. And we'd love it if you fancy it, if you would like to join us. Uh, you can head to www.eticketing.co.uk forward slash Premiership Rugby for a bit of GBNR pre-match action at Twickenham ahead of the Gallagher Premiership final. It is going to be, and there have been some belting finals, but it's going to be, hopefully, certainly on paper, one that matches up. The head-to-head, presuming the teams sort of fall out as as we expect they might, that you would most look forward to, or you'd pay a, pay a pound to go and watch, would be... Who are going to be the key men for you from this Saracens outfit? Well, I guess the obvious ones, Far- Farrell and Ford, right? I'm sure Tins will speak about that more eloquently than I, than I would do. But, you know, Owen's probably you know, under, well, under a lot of pressure from Marcus Smith and, and and probably didn't have his greatest game last last weekend, although I think he came back very right. well in the second yeah, half. Yeah, yeah, he played really well. And that shows half. experience and that yeah. shows a bit of wisdom. Um, and obviously George Ford's even a step further away than, than Owen, so both with a massive point to prove. And you know, both good mates, a lot of history, go a long way back. I, I think that's that that that's the one that I'm looking forward Some to. Some fabulous photos of Owen and George with proper mop tops. <laughs> I think back in England under sort of 14s, back that long. But you would have known Owen as a young pup coming through. And we were talking about Steve Borthwick being someone who laid down the law at 18 as soon as he came into uh, the bath setup. Was that very much Farrell Jr.'s way when he arrived at Saracens and came up through the ranks? I think when it comes to how they approach the game itself, very much so. You know. Um, Nothing is too much. No, no amount of analysis is too much. They would do anything they could do to get an edge on their opponents. You know, they would do anything they could to put in an extra hour on the field. And you know, we've spoken. Everyone's spoken about Owen at length. We know what he's all about. I think Owen de- delivers consistently in big games more than anybody else. I think technically, he's done so much work off the field that when it comes to to running onto Twickenham on a big day, that's his, that's his happy place. You know, and he's. He's just good in those in, in, in the cauldron. I, I love watching him play in finals. And is that is family it? DNA or is that p- a product of the setup at Saracens? What, what, what has contributed to him being so comfortable in those moments? I mean, listen, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't look at big fans and say there's no DNA involved there when it comes to <laughs> Owen. But um, but I think when Owen started playing at Saracens, you are, if you ask guys like you know uh, Brad Barrett who, who were there in the beginning, they wouldn't have thought Owen would turn, would have turned out to be you know one of the great English flowers or one of the great global flowers. He worked bloody hard to get to where he's got to. And for sure, there's an element of of coaching, you know, a technical assistance that he's got along the way. But to be that kind of bloody minded, I mean, that's that's down to Owen and, and the effort he's put in. Yeah. Won those head-to-heads for you, though, on Saturday? Because that, that leads in on that sort of form line. I think, well, Dom Run had a very inconsistent game, which whereas I thought Billy was, he was there every time he was needed. I, I still they marshaled him quite well, but he was still he still needs someone who's got footwork who steps up and does that carrying and sucks in two players, which I thought he did he did very well. Uh, you know, both as he's going to want to try and dominate that set piece game. You know, you saw you saw on the weekend Quinns wanted to try and keep it in, not playing the half. Don't invite Saris. You know, they want to be in your own forty where they can start playing their game, trying to keep them out of there. Both as isn't going to be scared of that set piece game, but those those 
those key players are going to have to stand up around that. And then, I, I mean, I, that, I think the Saris back line's in, in great form at the moment. I think they're probably just edging it for me in terms of form. Yeah. Um, yeah, the amount of tries they've scored and everything else has, has been ridiculous. So uh, it's, I think Leicester will be focusing, set pe- being a good old Leicester team, set piece first, and then they'll build off the nuggetiness of that. You, you're shouting at me if, I, if I'm stepping out of line here, but it is probably fair to say Saris have got more options in terms of where and how they attack. Ben, the, the question, as Tins is alluding to there, is can Leicester do the job up front that they need to do? Because it, th- there are no easy games in that department against Saracens. No, it's, it's, it's going to be complicated now. Do they have the striking power to do so? Possibly. Um, they're going to really going to have to step it up step it up a notch in terms of you know physicality intensity uh, obviously you know tins mentioned a lot of the the head to heads Julian Montoya against Jamie George is going to be a proper matchup. The, the, you know, the one who gets out of there is a world-class hooker and, and is, is going to bring his team a, a step forward. Ben Earl against uh, Rafael, that's going to be another proper clash. Um, do they have just the natural sheer size? Unfortunately not at the moment. Can they step it up backed by passion and expertise? I think so. Uh, if they do the same against the Saints, they will be they will come up short, 150%. If they, if they do the same as they did a couple of times by, you know, really stepping it a notch you never know if Steve Porwick doesn't rebalance his pack maybe start I don't know Oli Chesham you know or just mix it up a bit I don't know he can put a bit more stri- uh, striking power but they will be seriously tested they, they, I mean look they, they, that's starting eight even of, of Saracens have got the size but have got a huge amount of expertise and experience in there uh, and there will be a big old lump to to move around. So it's the the matchup is definitely going to be up there. It's definitely going to be the one to to zoom in on too, because it will be without being super boring. It will be the decider of who's going to come on top. I think uh, Vise at the at number eight for Leicester has got a massive job on. Uh, he was he's been so good. He'd never get stopped first up. He's got to get them go forward because obviously you're dealing with a quite a high pressure physical defence. You've got to be able to sort of crack that or at least dent it to allow the speed of ball to come. I think I I think on the weekend there was a stat that Saris were playing off two two and a half second rook speed, which you can't do. So the the back row has to do a job at that at breakdown time. You you won't win if you can if you constantly give a team that that speed rock ball. It's just impossible because you just never can get you can never then get a dominant tackle going forward unless they make a mistake. So um, there's a lot to be thought, a lot to think about for for Leicester. But I'm sort of I sit on the fence that that they've led from the start to finish. I think they've just been outstanding this year. I quite like them to win. I think if, if if Leicester can go and sit in the change room this week at the training ground and go, we are good enough to win this final, if we play like we've played for the last 24 weeks or however long it is, and manage to get that balance right between emotion and pragmatism, yeah. then for sure, form speaks for itself. They've been, they've been the form team. But I, I think it comes down to, for me, well, Saracens, I don't think, are expecting an emotional performance. It's just back to business, right? And I think sometimes emotion in these big games can actually get in the way of good, solid performances. And I just don't think Saris will be intimidated by that. But that, that, So that's the question that I'm trying to formulate. I'm not quite sure how to ask it. But there are finals. I mean, I'm thinking of the Rugby World Cup final 2019 as the prime example. England went in on Saris-like form and South Africa fired very few shots in that semi-final against Wales and yet found an emotional performance. And I'm, I'm sort of trying to draw a parallel between... Saracens in England and Leicester in South Africa. I, 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 maybe that's a very inaccurate way of doing it, but it feels like Leicester are going to have to find something else because if they don't, then Saris have got the experience and arguably a slightly sort of more varied attack. Am I, am I making... No, a, I, th- I, th- I think you're right. I, th- I, think, I think you're actually... I, I get what you're trying to do and I think you're, you're probably right. But, you know, Leicester, can, they just need to look back at the year and I, I think what they've got to do is try and push all that out of there. That, that's the thing that this big looming black cloud of Saracens brings is what they've won, how they've got there, how dominant they've been. Also a bit, you'll players get a little bit pissed off, they've been down, then they're back up and they're straight back in the mix at the fi- in the finals day. Um, but Leicester have just got to go, mate, we sat top, for the whole season, we beat we beat them at home. Um, even though it was close, it was a one point game. But we've got to believe it's neutral ground. Yeah, we've got to go and impact our game. I think you can get in in, the, in their situation. I think you can get too carried away about what they might bring. Uh, I think Leicester need to focus on what they are, which they've done ex- ex- exceptionally well this year. It's just one more game that you've got to do that. 
It's a complete lay-by to this conversation, but I do want to ask you about the money men and what the last 24 months has been like, because, I mean, you're still very much in contact with them. I mean, there have been some unbelievably painful scenarios for some of these players and certainly the administrators that they've gone through. Does any of that have a bearing, do you think? Is it is it totally irrelevant? Will it be used in any sort of way? No, I'd be a surprise if it did. Uh, I think... Uh... I, ge- I, I generally think Saracens are workmanlike, always have been, you know, and I think what's happened in the past and the salary cap and all that stuff has been discussed and, you know, poured over ad nauseum. They're certainly not going to go into the change room and say, we have a point to prove. They yeah. haven't spoken about redemption, you know, anything like that. They're just going, guys, we're a rugby team. We had to win trophies. It's back to work for us. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I've got to say, I think that's the right approach, right? That They don't match noise with noise. They don't match emotional banter in the press with them. It's like, we're in the, our bubble, we do what we want to do, and we focus on our people. And they've always been good at that. And the fact that people love to hate series, I think the guys have started to use that as fuel. Like, yeah. the, more, the more you give to them, the more you feed the beast, the, the, the better the guys become. So I, I think they'll be talking about the game, they'll look at Borthers and what he's brought to the team, they'll look at the technical stuff, and maybe Friday there's a bit of a, a, bit of a rev before the game. This is how we manage the emotion. But it's business as usual. Uh, and I don't, I don't think on the other side, Borthers will use it as a yeah. They yeah did this, nice. I don't think it, it's something that would be in Borthers locker. But I, I was going to say, all you also need to do is look at those players who went on loan for the for the seasons and how they've come back. Someone yeah. like Ben Earl, you know, player of the season, three tries on the weekend, you know, just ripping up trees straight back into the environment. Looks like he loves being there. Looks like he missed being there, even though he played out of his skin at Bristol as well. So yeah, Max Malins, yeah, too. Max Malins as well. So I think that's a sign of the environment. That you you can't get away with is they wanted to be back there. They were, you know, yeah. they were just they were in a Saracen shirt that had just been spray painted. And and not to speak for for the kind of leadership, you know, so to speak, or, or the or the directors, but I think they want to prove to everyone as well that okay, well, we have built something with with lasting culture. And, and it was really like for me re- rewarding to have Ben say, well, actually, uh, although I, I wanted to hate these guys, there was a certain amount of respect for how they did things. And I'm sure that those guys who've seen a lot in their time and they are successful businessmen, hence owning a rugby club. They also want to show people that they haven't just bought a club. They've built something that they're proud of. So it'll mean a lot to them to come out of the win on the weekend. There is something remarkable, and I'm not quite sure how both have done it, but there is a, there's an enormous amount of respect for Saracens as a neutral. And I never thought I'd say this, but I'd love to see Leicester do it. You said the same thing. And there are extraordinary emotions around the club, obviously, as we've touched on with Tom and, and Ben Youngs, etc. Ellis is our boy who has, has just grown and grown and grown over the last two years. Borthers has done an amazing job pulling the team together out of the ashes of a uh, sort of rubble. As said, Ashton, someone like Harry Potter stepping up, you know, the players who, you know, Freddie Burns, you know, resurgent as well. There's a, there's a lot, there's a lot there to like. Yeah. Um, you just, you just know there's a there's a very experienced bunch of people. You know, Leicester are trying to be, you know, trying to be Saris and get to that point. And I think they're on the path. Could it be? Can they get there straight off the bat, or are they going to have to lose some stinging finals yeah. before they get there? That's the question. It's the first time I've heard Chris Ashton and a lot to lack in the same sentence. <laughs> it's actually quite impressive. I've done that. Too. Can you believe he's still going? I can't. I know he's, he's incredible. I mean, for every well, for most clubs he's played for, he's done incredible things. It's just whether the guys can put up with them for long enough. <laughs> we know that feeling. I can't can't think who I'm referring to. Um, ben, I'm going to come to you, I, and I'm going to sort of ask each of you this question. What will happen on Saturday? Oh, wow. Um, I think originally you, you mentioned the analogy with the New Zealand-England game in the World Cup 2019. I don't really agree with it because I think there's, there's also a team profile type of thing that needs to be taken in consideration. I think if there's one team that could have beaten New Zealand in 2019 in semi, it would have been England. But if there's one team that could not beat Safa, it was going to be England in the final, if that makes sense. So, you know, if New Zealand got to the final, I believe they could have, they could have taken on the Springboks. There's also sort of profile that is, 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 is in between the two. Is it fair to say that Saracens and Leicester play a relatively similar type of game with Steve Borkthwick obviously being sort of the link between the two? I think so. So actually you can finally compare apples with apples. And so, and that's where it's going to be a, a really tough one to, to, to see. Um, I will not try to predict anything. I will just try to tell you that my heart is Leicester Tigers 100%. And I've seen Saracens, you know, have a big smile on their faces too many times next to me that uh, I, I will wish it for this wonderful club, uh, Leicester Tigers, to go back because they've gone through so much. On the other side, there is there's a beast of a team coming through. 
there is a beast of a team with a wealth of experience who will not give up anything, who who seem to be um, soulless and 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 feelingless because they just want to rip you apart every time they got you in front of you just for a, a final because right it's competition competition rugby and that's only fair. Uh, so I think we're gonna be we're gonna see a proper game of rugby that's going to be super intense. Is it going to be a Bristol Bears Harlequins type of game? You know, with chucking the ball everywhere. I don't think so. Is it going to be a bruising encounter of two relatively similar teams, uh, almost distant cousins, you know, linked by this one uncle that's <laughs> between the two that uh, sort of brought, brought the recipes in between? Uh, definitely. So I, I'm just looking forward for the matchup. It's going to be a proper forwards game. I'm looking forward to for the intensity, for, you know, the twisted tummies just before they set in. And that's why I, I love hearing sort of the Saracens mindset. Just another day at the office, you know, go from Monday to Friday, get added a little bit of red. I remember that phrase. I've got, got that one in my locker room now. Add a little bit of red and then go at it the next day. That's probably what I did really, really badly for 16 years. <laughs> Mate, I was adding red from Monday morning, first coffee, <laughs> brrr, full tilt, and smashing it. And by, by Saturday afternoon, I was flogged. So that was probably my main problems. Someone get that man a decaf. Um, <laughs> last year, 40-38 and all of the sort of jamboree that went with it this year? Well, Saracens are scoring a lot of tries this year. I mean, even uh, prepping for the Quinns game last week, you know, looking at the stats, Saracens were making, have made more passes per ruck than Harlequins made. Yeah. Um, again, we know that the line out at Leicester has been brilliant this season. Saracens, not as good. So, you know, I, I just wonder if it might be a, a, a bit of a reversal where it's can Leicester keep Saracens out, you know? Usually we talk about it the other way around. Saracens will defend well. The Seppies will be brilliant. But I actually wonder if Saracens will throw the ball around a bit and, and, and score some tries this weekend. Um, but as Ben says, you know, ultimately forwards win matches and backs just decide by how much, right? So get the platform, right? And and and, and I think both sides will relish it. I, I've got to say that the, I think the experience will tell. I think Saracens and those teams, those guys have lost a lot. They've won a lot. I think they'll, they'll, they will approach that final with, they'll, they'll be meticulous in their prep and I don't think they'll be overwhelmed. And if there's one Achilles team to what is a great Leicester side, and, and, and I've got to say that, you know, everyone loves Leicester. It's just an iconic club in, in, in English rugby. So it's great to see them doing well again. But I've got to think that the experience of Saracens has got to pay off this weekend. Yeah. A lot of niceties ahead of the Prem final. Yeah, but I, th- I, th- I, don't, I just don't think that anyone can argue with the two guys, the two teams in the final. No. I think I think you've got two great teams, two who deserve to be there on merit, two different stories along the way, and let's go to war and see where the dust settles. Saris looking for their fifth title in eight years, Leicester for their first in ten. So and that, that maybe that, is the difference. Might, that might be the most important thing. Okay, we shall see. Really good fun. Thank you. What's on the agenda? What's to come in the next few days, weeks? You'll be there on Saturday, I presume. Yeah, correct. There on Saturday. Um, yeah, back back to the Wolfpack. Keeping busy, keeping my, my, my lovely business partner, Chris Wiles, in the straight and narrow. Yeah. But I'm um, looking forward to, to, to a good summer. Hashtag alcohol, by the side. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag alcohol. <laughs> alcohol and golf. <laughs> alcohol and golf. Ben, what's happening? You're, you're there on Saturday. What else have you got going on? Ah, Saturday, Saturday. No, I'll be super happy to be there and then just a couple of trips to France to uh, keep myself busy. But uh, no, really looking forward to it. Good. Um, we're going to link to your interview with Richard Cockrell in the moment because actually he was talking about the Prem final as well, wasn't he? I think yes, he, he was, was DOR in 2012 when they would be. Uh, yes, he would have been. Yes, he would have been. Because he signed Ellis as well. He signed Ellis. Before that though. Which and, we got into as well. Okay, well, looking forward to that. Um, Phil Bennett. I know. We, we were I, talking earlier, obviously, about the desperate news around Tiff uh, yeah, Youngs, but Phil Batman, oh, just it's just, just it's just sad, isn't it, to lose lose players of who have changed who've changed the game, changed the game. You yeah. know, he was such a and such a great man. To, you know that all those Welsh legends. You know, Sir Gareth is the, when you meet them, yeah, and you go in there and how they used to tour and all the stories they tell and how they tell them and you know Phil Bennett always t- told a great story about the ninety nine call. And it was hit the nearest person to you, so he did, and it was the ball boy, and he won. It was the only <laughs> fight he ever won. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, it's just those sort of moments about great, great players, and you know, he, you look about him and just pace and eye for a gap, and then the footwork to die for in the in the in that sort of seventies era where side st- fall away side steps with a yeah. with a with the a, old slinky hips. Yeah, just great to watch. Um, so sad. There's so a love, sad. lovely article from Siri McGeekin in the Telegraph just titled Farewell Benny, dear friend, teammate and rugby genius. And I was very fortunate. I did a couple of shows with him back in the sort of sky days, Lions Legends, and just 
just an absolute gent. Just made you feel, he could pour a pint and sit there. Well, you'd, you'd have been very keen. You could have a pint <laughs> with him until the cows came home. Just one of the true greats. And obviously enormous sympathies to all his family and friends and those um, in and around Parker Scarlet. So very sad to say goodbye to Phil Bennett. You have been chatting with Richard Cockrell, England forwards head coach. All right, England forwards coach. Let's go with that. Leicester legend. Uh, Cockers is back in camp with uh, Penny Hill Park with England this week. Uh, talking about England against the Barbers. Quite an interesting looking team, actually, potentially being picked out of that. Yeah, I mean, he's, there's a, what, 10 uncapped players within yeah. that. Um, you don't really know what the Barbars are going to throw at you. Well, you know it's going to be loose. You know you might get drunk on the fumes that are coming off them. <laughs> you know, you know, Sign up, out. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is Wolfpack fueling them this, this week? Oh, um, powered by Wolfpack. Uh, so you, you just, you, and it's, you just don't know what's coming and and we sort of got into how do you prepare for that and then obviously going down to Australia. For, I know it's not really their summer yet over there but it's still probably get fast tracks um, and, and they're a, a young group of, a, a really young team in Australia and do you, are you trying to combat that with young players or are you, is this actually what's going to go take us forward? So there's yeah. a little bit of everything. Okay, it's the French, it's the French Babas, no? Oh, is I it? It's Fab Fab yeah, it's Fabien Galtier oh, and it's all his Fabien coaching Galtier's staff for taking them over. Damien Penault, Charles Olivon is going to be the captain for the English Papas. Well, it's fine, you know, stay focused just on you, you, you. Don't speak <laughs> about my boys. For once that on, they're doing this, you know, they're only I the Grand Slam champions, point right? Two, uh, our 0.23% it, it, French audience will, uh, <laughs> will berate us for it. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's such a rarity now that you actually, because yeah. French the, the French are the best team in the world that they get in the bar bars. And normally it's full of Kiwis and, and yeah. Arthurs, but... Welcome I, to the party, Ben. <laughs> tell, Thank you very much. Fa, how much will Fabian Galtier relish the opportunity to just inflict a little more? Is, is TikTok's going to go off the, yeah, the scale but, as but, well? But just, you know, because it, obviously he's got a grand slam in the back pocket. He's got just a chance with absolutely no expectation pressure at all just to hump a whole lot more on Eddie Jones' to-do list. Is that something oh, one, you would one, quite enjoy? One, 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 1,000%. And, you know, if there's one guy who's going to have the Saracen smile after a big victory, if he beats, you know, Eddie Jones, it's going to be him. No, they, they're going to the Japan after that. So they're testing those players. There's going to be a lot of rotations. But Charles Olivon, the captain who came back from ACL, is going to lead the way. So that he he said it as a laboratory. Uh, it's going to be his own lab before he takes that team on tour. So it's actually going to be pretty serious. I know I mean, William Salvat will be out every single now, night in, in London, 1,000%. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the boys are going to be taking this very seriously. Right, should we do this interview? I've been going around this roundabout for about 10 minutes. Just before we get to Richard Cockrell with Tins, we've got a little note from Honda on the pod this week, the official performance partner of England Rugby, who are bringing the power of dreams to the game that we all love. Honda are playing a big role with the volunteers in the English game at the moment, and they understand how English fans feel about the sport as well. The supporters' relationship with the team, their achievements, the hopes and those who dream the impossible dreams. Honda believes in a challenging spirit, embracing failure, which, as we've said before, might be why they like working with us, and the joy of trying things, which we certainly give our best efforts to as well. Just like England Rugby and their supporters, Honda does believe in the power of dreams, and you can find out more at honda.co.uk forward slash engine room forward slash Honda XRFU. Go and have a little look at that. But... As promised numerous times over, here is the England forwards coach Richard Cockrell talking with Tins earlier today. So Richard, thanks for joining us. Uh, first day back in full, full day back in camp. Uh, how's the mood? Lots of uncapped players. How's everyone feeling? Yeah, good. Excited. It's um, a lot of fresh faces, a lot of guys uh, into the environment for the first time, um, uh, getting a taste of it. And obviously looking forward to what's hopefully going to be a good game at the weekend. Is Eddie easing them in or is he uh, is he letting them know what's expected right from the off? Oh, we have pretty uh, strong standards, as you can imagine. So uh, everybody's on their toes and working hard. So uh, this is an environment for, for guys to, to prove themselves and, and, and put their best foot forward to, to get to Australia and, and obviously be involved in the future. Is it is it hard for a, a coach... I, I've coached the Barbarians and that's an easy gig. <laughs> that's an easy gig, is it... <laughs> It, is it is it hard to be on the other side where you can't re you know the players that are coming but you can't predict what's coming, or, or do you just have to put that completely out of your mind and just go let's focus on those set piece let's get our set piece stuff right and then let's play our game and and we'll see where it lies. I think you have to do that. I think you, obviously the Barbarians will have a very good side. There's no pressure on them. They've, they've come to play and entertain. Um, and for ourselves, it's it's about concentrating on what we're trying to do. 
like you say, around the set piece parts, but also how we're trying to play and lots of young, talented guys in there that will have the first experience of of playing in the in the national side or certainly the senior national side. So um, no, it's an exciting week and one where we should we should look forward to it and be excited around what these young guys can do. With um, with it being a Barbarians game, and as you say, there are a lot of young players in that. Do you is any will any buy into it in some ways? The Barber, some of the you know the six on cat backs that you've got, they've got some you've got some proper proper talent in there that people want to see. Is it sometimes hard not to get drawn into going right? We're playing the Barbarians. Let's give these guys that um, their free reign to go and do it. Or is it still planning? We've got a tour to Australia. We've got to make sure where this is a game that's going to help us in that three test tour later on. Yeah, I think there's I think there's a real balance there. Um, the, Eddie encourages the guys to play if it's if it's if it's on to play and there's opportunity in front of them that they've got every all the license to go and take that. So as you say, we've got some very exciting backs out there uh, who've got a lot of uh, ability and pace and, and create uh, a lot of opportunities and create chaos in in uh, opposition defences. So if, if those opportunities are there, they've got full license to take them. If they're not there, then obviously we have to play within within system um, because we know the Barbars will have a very talented team. And what will they want? They'll want it to be like fast and loose. <laughs> they'll want it ca- they'll want chaos. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sure wherever they are in the world, I'm sure they're having a, a, a slightly different one <laughs> themselves. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've played in these yeah. games myself for the Barbars, and it was uh, yeah, there wasn't much training going on. So, uh, but it's yeah. a, it's a it's a wonderful week if you're a barbar barbarian. Don't don't get too close to individuals, or you might you might end up feeling a little worse for wears as the alcohol seeps into you. Um, no, we can't we can't have a chat with you without quickly jumping to Leicester. Um, how happy are you to see the turnaround that's happened over the, oh, since the last two years, the last two years to where they are now? And how how does it get, make you warm and fuzzy inside to see your your old team doing that? You obviously were so ensconced within them for so long. Oh look, they've done a great job rebuilding after the obviously a couple of years of of being. Um, you know, dropping off the standards that they would they would see themselves to, to be at. Um, look, Steve Borthwick's done a great job and the team he's brought in, a coaching team, but also the recruitment that the whole club have done to to realign themselves with their DNA. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I, I always spent 23 years at Leicester, so I'm always going to have a part of me that's uh, that looks for their results. But it's a great city, great rugby city, great supporters. And, and look, Steve's brought back the the crooks of the DNA of, of the club and it suits Leicester doesn't it wherever they you know the part they want to develop their game moving forward that they're always going to be set on um being you know very efficient good set piece and, and tough tough to play against which they've proved this year what do you what do you it's it's always times like this that I question the playoff system where a team has gone from week one to week uh, the final week at the, in the first spot first time it's ever been done um I sort of hope they go on and win it, but does it? Does it it always feel bad. It always make me a bit. I'd be a bit stung if you've sat there all that way and you fail at the final hurdle. I, I've done it numerous times for Gloucester, and it, it really did hurt me most of the t- by the by the hands of Leicester actually. Um, uh, Tua Lange running over Ryan Lamb is still in, is burned into my memory banks. But uh, do you ever think, oh God, I wish we didn't have the playoff system still, or do, do we just accept it now? And- oh, for me, you probably accept it. You know, you know it's happening at the start of the season, so um, it's about making sure one, you're in that top four, top two, because you want to be at home in a semi final, um, and being right for the, for those playoff games. So it's the, it. I think it's a it, because of the way the season's structured and guys are missing a lot of time with test duty, etc. I just think the way that is, and even when I was coaching. Um, at Leicester, you you probably thought it was a fair way of doing it, having top four to playoffs because of the way the international um, game interrupts the the league system. So, look, um, the two best teams are in the final; they're the most consistent over the over the season, um, and it it should be uh, it should be a great occasion on on Saturday. Um, that also brings me on to the fourth wheel of our fun bus, Ellis. How have you been really impressed by how much he's changed? I mean. We, since he's been involved with the podcast, I'm not going to say that we've we've made this change, you know, within him. I'm not going to take in any way credit for that. But uh, have you just the maturity and how he's grown as a player? Um, do you see that a when you're in camp? Obviously, you might not, you won't, have, you wouldn't have been, been at Leicester when he grew, he joined. But what he's turned into, there you go. So, 
how much you've seen him change and how much he's grown and how much he's grown into this international now as well. He, he's been brilliant, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's um, he's very probably different to the to the usual players we see. He's got a lot of character. He's got he's very outspoken right. in what he believes in. And the, I was going to say, he's a bit, he's a bit, does he, he's a bit like you. Is he a younger version <laughs> of you in I'll, terms of... I'll take that. I'll take that. If I if if Ellis Genge is the, is the modern Richard Cockrell, I'll take that. I'm not sure that's quite correct, but <laughs> but no, no he's like I, I signed him at Leicester, you know, five or six years ago, and he was he he, he needed a bit of guidance, and um, from then to now, he's matured um, very very well. I think he found a real spiritual home at Leicester because it suited the way he played and his mentality. Obviously, he's moving on back to Bristol because that's the right thing for him and his family. But yeah, it, here, I think the more he's played and cemented his place in the team, he's been uh, given the opportunity to lead um, uh, in certain parts of the environment. And he's, he's really taken that on board and that's sort of made him um, more thoughtful, more responsible, but not taking away the, the things that we love about Genji, which is, you know, the way he goes about his business, the way he plays, that sort of, you know, he's a bit rough around the edges, isn't he, which everybody loves. and The ability to look like he's never having fun. Yeah, he is really. He is, yeah. No, again, he's, good. <laughs> he's, he's great off the field. Like, he's a good crack. He's always um, making fun for the group. And But, yeah, like, he's matured out of sight. Like, if, if you'd have said to me six years ago when I first met him to now, would he be where he's at? Yeah, I, I I might have had a slight question mark, but no credit to himself uh, and credit to the club that, he, that Leicester that he's played for and, and people that have helped him. He's um, he's now probably one of our our leading senior players. I think that's uh, great to have around all these young players that you're coming in in terms of the young cap guys as well. I think he he really does set an example in an unassuming way of he'll let you know if you don't get it right. <laughs> So you, you feel- yeah, whether you're a coach or a player, he's not he's not shy in letting you know, uh, give you some feedback. So, which is a great thing, and vice versa. Yeah. No, he's a, he's a good man. He's he's um, I've been very impressed with him. Uh, obviously, someone who you he'll rely on a lot going to Australia. What you know? What are you expecting? Yeah, you know, with all these uncapped players, is it right to you know going on a tour to Australia, three cap tour? Is is the idea there? To go with, well, obviously, you'll be to win all three tests, but is it also to experiment with players? Is it the right time to be experimenting with players? Uh, we're going there to win. That's the, that's the first objective um, when you're playing for England uh, against anybody. Um, if guys earn the right to play in the test matches, the young guys deserve the opportunity and they've earned it, and Eddie, Eddie decides that that's the right thing, then they'll have every opportunity to play. So you know, we've got this week's training. We're obviously then... Um, off to Oz and the, the other guys will join us. Um, everybody's uh, got the opportunity to play. And we've seen this last 12 months or so, some young guys get their opportunity and and win, win their place in the team on a full-time basis. So um, first we're there to win. We know it's going to be, you know, the, the rivalry is going to be white hot when we get there. Um, they're, you know, they're sat there waiting for us in Perth. We know that what's coming. Um, but for young guys, take their opportunity by training well and impressing and showing their the aptitude that they can cope at this level. They'll get the opportunity, but it's down to them to earn the right. Eddie's always always said when he jumps around competitions, you know, he said about Six Nations, you know, it's going to be attritional. Obviously, going uh, to Australia, they've got a very young group, group of players as well, very sort of high tempo pace. What we talked, chaos. What you talked about is that also a reason why he's taking. There's so many young players in the group. Is he going to sort of match fire with fire? Is he going to... I know that he wants to play fast ruck speed, high tempo. Is that why he's taking these groups? Of, uh, these, he's pulled this specific group of players together is just so that if if he is can fight fire with it, with it, fire of his own, if that makes sense. Yeah, no. And we've got a, a, a young group of very talented backs. There's some real pace there, isn't there? And some real flair. And they've, they've done it in the premiership and they're still very young men. Um but that they've proved that they can, they can, um, you know, on the biggest stage, you know, um, Henry Arundel at Toulon, like it's a wonder try, isn't it? Um, yeah. So they put themselves in the in the picture to to get selected on the, you know, converse of that. You have Jack Noel and Johnny May, who are seasoned operators who are still operating at a very high level. So we, we've got we've got a really good opportunity to mix and match if we if we want to. Um, so I dreamed to be in that back line. I had a, I had a forward pack who'd kick the crap out of me if I did half the stuff that the backs do today. I'd have you punching me in the face, going, "No, just kick it. Let's get it down there." 
Uh, do, do you, do, what do you, how hard has it been for you to make that transition into the fact, you know how I always look at it and it was all about putting the ball in front of the forwards to embracing the full 360 rugby where you've got to be able to go from anywhere. You've got to give the people to the ability, giving players the ability to showcase their skill set. Have you? Did you find that tough at any point through your coaching career? Uh, of course, because um, especially when you're playing in club level, it's about winning, especially at Leicester. Leicester didn't care. You, as long as you won, that's, that was the main objective. They didn't care how you won or how you got went about it, just win. So that does sometimes put the shackles on you a little bit. But as you become more experienced as a coach and you, you become more comfortable in your own skin, you, you then can let let it breathe a little bit. And, you know, talented backs, especially young backs, they want to play and show their show their their ability. So you have to play within a structure that that actually lets them do that. And you know we have that here in England. Um, but it's then about making the right decisions, isn't it? You know that. If it's on, we play. If it's not, well, we have to make good decisions and make sure that we don't put ourselves under undue pressure for 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 no gain. And then, and you've well, you joined in September the England uh, the England group. Um, so how have you found the first? whatever that is, 10 months. Um, have you enjoyed the environment? Have, you know, there's always, I don't want to get into it, but there's always speculation about what the environment, how hard Eddie works his coaches. Uh, I always, you know, I I always thought with your straight talking, you probably get on pretty well with him. You'll, you'll have a couple of clashes here and there. How have you found it? No, good. Just very different, you know, from day-to-day club, rug, club coaching where you're seeing everybody every day. Now, I've coached eight games in nine months, so it's just very different. Um, the great learning environment here, like I've seen seen and learned things that you know, I probably should have had at the start of my coaching career, not 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 sort of twenty years into it. So, um, and if you want to be the best in the world, you have to work hard. So there's we don't make any excuses of, of that. Eddie Eddie likes to do things in certain ways, and he's a very experienced coach, and he does it he does it very very well. So, and um, we've got a great group. Like um, you know, for Eddie to be. He's been doing it for six years to then try and reinvent this team again to go to the next World Cup to to, to have the uh, mentality to go and win it. Um, it takes a lot of hard work, so no one's worried about that. You've never shirked work before, have you? And that's the one thing I can do is work. <laughs> um, and then what about yourself in terms of, do you, do you ever as a coach get to look forward in terms of aspirations, where you want to be or... Are you, are you always plotting a map to, or you, you live in each, well, at the moment, each campaign at a time and, and see where you're at the end of it? Yeah, I've never really, as a coach, sort of had that plan of what's happening next because, um, as we know in the sporting world, it's a very fickle world, isn't it? So I try and get what's in front of me right and do a good job. Um, and what if opportunities arise moving forward, then you look at them. And I've always sort of had that uh, sort of mentality towards my, my, my coaching career because you, you start looking too far ahead of what's next. You, you, you start to miss what's happening now. And the most important thing is what's happening now. Richard, thank you very much uh, for speaking with us. I hope you have a fantastic time in Australia. Obviously, get the Bar Bars win under the belt first, but then we all know that uh, Australia is a great place to tour. I'm, I'm sure there'll be f- some fun had out there. Um, and I just want to wish you all the best. Cheers, Tim. Thanks very much. Um, well done. Very nice interview. What, what, was, what were the headlines? Um, what what oh, were you most it, surprised it, by? It, it, not, he didn't really give that much away, as, as Cock has always, always had. He's, he's been well trained yeah, by the England media department. But he, he was never someone who, who really gave... Oh, he uh, gave brilliant sound bites. Yeah, sound bites, but he, he, he's not giving those really now. The no. most, I, yeah, I only got him to crack a smile when we were talking about barbarians and, and talking about what the, how the barbars would be preparing yeah. the rest of it was pretty much straight down the line uh everything was pretty much media handbook tried to oh, how's it working with eddie didn't didn't quite get what i was didn't, hoping for no it's all right you wouldn't because you, you would be, say people, people, people who, handed you a, a flaming grenade well yeah i was hoping that occasionally he was like yeah we've bumped horns a few times but no, we no, didn't get that. they're all on brand danny care i i mean it's great to see him back my worry is is he just back for the Barbars game until the, the finals finished, and then, or is he in? It'll be interesting because I think he'll, he's got an opportunity. He he's has got an opportunity, chance. and and I think he he has been outstanding this this season. Deserves it. Um, will he get the game time to go and, and and show it? Let's let's hope he does, and let's hope he can take it because I know he's still massively hungry. He's 
you know, I, I, I spoke to him today as well. I know he's he's massively hungry to make it count, and let's let's see if he gets that opportunity. What do you make of England at the moment? Just as someone who's been in around the game over here, and knowing all the salaries boys as you do, quick fixes. Um, Big I concerns. I, I don't know if they. We spoke about if, if and I always go back to series, obviously, but we spoke about consistency of selection and yeah. teams that you know stay together, win together. If there's any weakness, it's in those it's in those combinations, right? And you'd like to see consistent selection, backing a few horses that you know are going to do the job in in a year's time, right? And if you can get that right, then always a force to be reckoned with. If not, it's 50-50 on any given day. Absolutely. Shall we leave it there? Do, if you're coming to Twickenham on Saturday, we'd love to see you there as part of GBNR. There are tickets still available, I think, for the Prem Final. We're going to England Barbars on Sunday as well. It's going to be a bumper, hopefully, Scorchio weekend at Twickenham. Uh, if you're watching on the telly, enjoy it all on BT Sport. Thank you very much indeed, all. Just before we go, a little promo for a belting episode of The Good, The Scouts and The Rugby this week. Elmer, Scouts and Mo are back in studio with the wonderful Ashley Wilmot, one of the breakout broadcasters from this year's women's rugby. She was covering the final with Mo last week and she was the lady asking all of the questions where Scouts got her 100th cap at Welford Road a couple of weeks ago. Scouts and Mo enjoyed turning the tables on Ashley and asking the questions this week for a change. It's really good fun and um, almost as chaotic as we are actually at GBR. So, um, yeah, the bug is spreading. Go and have a listen to that if you'd like to. We have been the good, the bad and the rugby. Thank you once again to Al. Thank you to Ben and thank you to Tins. The show is produced by Shara Kilgallen and Sam the Man Roberts. The good, the bad and the rugby is a folding pocket production. Have a great rest of your week and we'll see you soon. Bye for now.